Good afternoon, Your Excellency, Good European afternoon. Union Ambassador to ASEAN, Mr. Igor Driesmans. It's very nice to meet you. Happy to be here. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to speak with you today. And I would like to just jump into our first question sure. of the day. Uh, as we both know, the partnership between the EU and ASEAN has recently evolved to strategic partnership back in 2020. One of the reasons is so that we could face global challenges together. Could you possibly tell us what are some of the solutions that this partnership has produced since its inception? Sure. Well, maybe let me start by saying that I, I, I think we share a common outlook on the world, uh, and that is based on the fact that we're both regional organizations. So we're both, in a way, mini multilateral organizations. We live through compromise, consensus making, cooperation, uh, the finding of kind of common solutions within our own group. So that's the kind of outlook that we have for the world, too. We think that cooperation is the answer. Uh, not uh, competition or not confrontation. So uh, basically we both believe in multilateralism, in a rules-based international uh, order, uh, and that's what we've been trying to pursue to address these uh, global challenges. And I mean there's many, but if, if I can take one, it would be climate change. How do we fight that existential uh, threat to uh, the planet? And we've been working on a number of layers. First of all, a number of technical dialogues. We get our experts together to see how can we deal with circular economy, uh, how can we deal with biodiversity, etc. We also have a number of uh, cooperation programs, financial programs, uh, support to ASEAN initiatives on smart green cities, on the managing of uh, pitlands, etc., etc. And lastly, what we will add is a political level, because we need a political conversation. We need our ministers to get together to see how we tackle these. So next year, we will have our first EU ASEAN ministerial meeting on environment and climate change. So jumping off of that point, we both know that the EU ASEAN commemorative summit will be held just a few days away, uh, 14th of December in Brussels, to be exact. Could you tell us the agenda highlights that will be discussed in the summit? Well, I mean, the green transition we just spoke about, that will definitely be high uh, on the agenda. Uh, secondly, we will have a good conversation, I hope, on connectivity. How do we reinforce the links between our two uh, uh, organizations, between our people, between our economies? Uh, we have just concluded uh, and signed a comprehensive air transport agreement, which, make, will, which will make it much easier to travel. Uh, uh, with uh, airlines uh, between Southeast Asia and, and Europe. That's a big deal for our airline uh, companies, but obviously also for our customers and, and for the people of Southeast Asia uh, and uh, Europe, linking 37 countries uh, uh, together. But uh, the kind of broader story of how to reinforce the connectivity will be high uh, on the agenda. Uh, thirdly, of course, we both face a number of security challenges. We face on the European continent a war of aggression by Russia on Ukraine. Uh, and I think we need to see how that we can uh, both uh, tackle uh, this because what's happening, uh, the almost daily shelling of uh, uh, Ukraine, the very blatant violation of international law, of the sovereignty uh, of uh, Ukraine is something that should concern uh, all of us and concerns uh, uh, us all. So we will uh, definitely have a good conversation uh, on that. And also here in Southeast Asia, there are, there are security issues. I think about the situation in Myanmar, uh, which is still uh, uh, un unresolved after the coup just uh, two years later. And we'll need to see how we can both uh, push for a return to uh, democracy uh, in Myanmar. So speaking of uh, security issues, with the war raging on between Ukraine and Russia and continuing to disrupt global supply chains, I know that the EU has sought to hasten negotiations regarding free trade agreements with third-party nations, including Indonesia. Do you think the EU could come to a mutual agreement regarding FTA negotiations with Indonesia? I, I hope so, and I think so. Uh, we, we basically are the fundamentals of our trade are strong. Uh, Indonesia and uh, EU are important trade partners uh, to each other, but we're still 
below the potential that such uh, that our trade uh, could possibly reach. So that's why we started negotiations of a so-called SEPA, Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, Agreement. Both of our leaders, uh, Commission President von der Leyen and your president uh, met uh, just a few weeks back uh, in Bali. And I think they both instilled a new momentum in those uh, negotiations. Uh, we think it's uh, possible to reach uh, such an agreement by, uh, by within the current uh, Indonesian uh, administration. Uh, and I think, as you say, there's a sense of urgency that comes with uh, the war in, in Ukraine. We need, we need more trade amongst uh, like-minded countries. We need more uh, uh, cooperation. So we hope that we can conclude an ambitious uh, SEPA in the coming uh, uh, months or years. I think we are all hopeful about that. And I know that the EU is actively engaged with ASEAN in expanding trade and investment relations. Uh, how does the EU see ASEAN as a trade partner? Well, I think ASEAN is, is still blessed with a very substantial economic uh, uh, growth, uh, likely be to become the fourth uh, economic uh, uh, power by 2030, uh, doubling its middle class by 2030. And of course, that raises uh, a lot of opportunities for trade and investment for uh, Europe and Southeast Asia. So we're keen to exploit those uh, opportunities and that's why we have concluded uh, agreements and entered into force with Singapore and Vietnam. We've just mentioned uh, the agreement uh, with uh, Indonesia, which we hope to conclude. And we're also reflecting on uh, other bilateral negotiations with other ASEAN countries, which we could uh, uh, resume. Uh, and hopefully those will then constitute the building blocks for a, a real region-to-region -region, uh, FTA in a not-that-distant future. Yeah. So when do you see this FTA with negotiations with Indonesia come to fruition? Well, uh, as I said, the, the current uh, Indonesian administration will uh, last until mid-2024, so we think it's possible to conclude an ambitious FTA in that, in that time frame. So. Uh, uh, we'll see what our negotiators uh, come up with. But I think the political momentum uh, uh, is there. The geopolitical context pushes us mm. to, uh, to proceed with uh, these negotiations in, a, in an accelerated way. So uh, let's uh, give them some trust and see what they come up with. So in late 2021, the EU stepped up its strategic engagement with the Indo-Pacific region. How are these two regions connected? And why is the Indo-Pacific region strategically important for the EU? Well, we're uh, first of all connected economically. Uh, we have a trade between the EU and the Indo-Pacific of 1.5 trillion uh, a year. We make up 70% of global trade <coughs> in goods and, and services. So the trade uh, and economic ties are hugely uh, uh, important. Uh, but for us, there's also a security uh, 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 consideration in our uh, push towards closer ties with the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we uh, often mention that 40% uh, of our maritime trade goes through the South China Sea. So what happens uh, in the South China Sea is extremely important uh, for us. The stability of the region is very important. Uh, to us, and we of course see there, are, there is ge geopolitical tension, big power competition, but we have an interest in a, uh, in a regional uh, stability, in a regional architecture that can face uh, some of these uh, security uh, concerns. That's why we have launched our Indo-Pacific strategy. Mm. Uh, ASEAN itself has its uh, outlook on the Indo-Pacific, uh, and I think the both strategies have a lot in common. We're both uh, inclusive, be based on cooperation, as I said earlier, and um, both anchored in the centrality of ASEAN uh, Indo in the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, because we we both think uh, we both believe in a strong ASEAN. I think that's in the interest of the European Union to have a strong ASEAN, both uh, internally but also uh, able to make be that balancer between different uh, powers in the uh, Indo-Pacific. So another reason to look forward to the EU-ASEAN summit at the uh, in just, what is it, 10 days time, 11 days yes, time? Yes, just a couple more days. Yeah, that's right. I, I know that you are planning on visiting, on going to the summit. 
uh, are you hopeful that the summit will produce significant results? Uh, I, I am. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's, it's rather significant as such that uh, all of the ASEAN leaders uh, travel uh, to Brussels and it's equally significant that all of our 27 leaders will be there, the leaders of the uh, heads of state and government of the EU uh, member states. So it's a coming together of a very uh, big uh, uh, chunk of leaders uh, and um, we have a, a very heavy agenda ahead of us, but I think it goes to show how dense the EU ASEAN strategic uh, partnership uh, has come and the many things that we can do together in the future. So I'd like to backtrack a little bit to strategic partnerships. So far, uh, the two large nations that have economic uh, influence in the Indo-Pacific regions are China and the States. So China has recently signed the RCEP, or the Regional Cooperation Economic Partnership, whereas the States have signed the IPEF, or the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. What type of framework or strategy can the EU offer to enhance its economic cooperation or partnership with the Indo-Pacific region, all the while competing with China and US? Well, I think we, we pursue our own course. Uh, we talked about the FDA negotiations, uh, which uh, are, have been concluded or might be resumed uh, with uh, ASEAN countries. But we have a very dense network of uh, FDA, uh, uh, FTAs ongoing. Uh, and I might mention Japan, I might mention uh, uh, Korea, I might mention uh, New Zealand, Australia. Uh, and I think the characteristic of our agreements, which we conclude, is that they are very ambitious, very deep. They are really aimed to transform the trade uh, and uh, economy. I think that's what sometimes distinguishes the FTAs, which we conclude, through uh, the more uh, uh, shallow uh, FTAs, which others do, because the purpose really is to, m to give a significant boost to uh, trade uh, and investment on, 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 on both sides. So if you look at the impact that the FTA had on the trade between the European Union and Singapore, between the European Union and Vietnam, you can see they do make a difference, but uh, it requires that they are indeed ambitious, that they do uh, uh, have a substantial uh, impact on competition, on services, on sustainable development uh, uh, over and beyond the increase in, in goods, for example. Okay. Thank you so much for your insights today, Mr. Dursmans. I hope you have a wonderful day ahead of you. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much. Thank you.